Still trickling in, okay. Well, good afternoon, folks. Or not quite afternoon, sorry. It's uh, still morning, pardon me. Uh, moving a little too fast on that. At this point, I have the, the great privilege to introduce a gentleman who has assumed a job that um, there's not a day that goes by I don't lament that he has this problem <laughs> to work with. <laughs> Having uh, dealt with this capacity in a prior existence, this is not for the, uh, the lighthearted, that's for sure, but uh, Robert is positively up to the task and has done a remarkable job, I think, of working through some really extraordinary challenges. He is, at this point, as a consequence of all the challenges these days of getting through the confirmation process for anybody, is the longest serving acting administrator in NASA history. <laughs> so this is, the beatings will continue until morale improves, Robert. I mean, that's just the way you'd have to look at this, you know. Uh, but he has been appointed to this capacity by din of his exceptional reputation, his great uh, uh, integrity and credibility as the highest ranking career public servant at NASA and is doing a, a commendable job, I think, of really working through the day in and day out operational issues of what it takes to lead an agency of the extraordinary caliber that we know NASA is. He is a graduate of the University of Alabama. No doubt he has still celebrating the umpteenth national championship that uh, Nick Saban has produced. Uh, so as a consequence, uh, he comes to this as a proud mem member of the Crimson family. And in Alabama, you know very well that there is two schools of thought. He represents that one, <laughs> but also gets along with the folks in Auburn as well. So don't worry, you know, it works out very well. He uh, started his NASA career in 1989 as a test engineer and program manager. Uh, served at uh, both the Stennis Space Center in Mississippi as well as at the Marshall Space Flight Center uh, in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, and over the course of his career, in many different capacities at Marshall in particular, rose to the uh, position as director, center director for Marshall itself. This is one of the more and one of the most extraordinary storied uh, uh, institutions and centers in the NASA family uh, operation. And is one steeped in the kinds of issues that uh, much of the discussion is going to concentrate on during the course of this afternoon. So he will set the stage here in a couple of moments on some of those questions. Uh, from his capacity as a center director, he moved on to become the associate administrator of NASA here in Washington, D.C. And in the course of that really remarkable career that he's pursued, he has received numerous awards. As you've read in the program, he was a three-time presidential rank award recipient, which is the highest honor offered to any public servant. But I would argue he is probably the proudest of the one he received some years ago during his time with the <coughs> shuttle propulsion efforts uh, from the astronaut corps. This is a very rare recognition that the astronaut corps offers every year, which is called the Silver Snoopy. And that's the one I think he, pr he prides himself the most, is it recognizes those who have really gone above and beyond to make uh, missions successful and safe, and of course, along the way. So please join me in welcoming a really remarkable public servant and a fellow we all should admire a great deal, Robert Lightfoot. All right, thank you, Sean. Thanks for that introduction. Um, it is great to be here. Um, I will share, like I've been sharing with my own team, that having the record for the longest uh, running acting administrator for those of you that are Bull Durham fans, that's like having the minor league home run record. Nobody knows or cares um, <laughs> too much. So uh, it, has been, it has been an interesting year. Um, I told the team, probably in a little bit of a, I would say more arrogant way, 
when this first happened that we're going to run until apprehended. I didn't know we'd be running this long. Um, so anyway, it's been fun. It's a great team. Um, and, and just since you said umpteenth, I'll say 17 national champions <clears throat> uh, from the university. So it's been a, it's been a good week and a good month for me um, from that perspective. Uh, it is good to be here. I, I know you guys, you know, you said in route to the moon, um, but we're really talking about resiliency here and, and how, do we, how do we as a space agency have a resilient um, architecture and a resilient systems that we need to be able to do the great things that we want to do. Um, you know, it is great to see Sean again. Uh, I, I came up to D.C. on my first D.C. trip right after Columbia and, and Sean helped lead us through that, that, that event. Um, hard to believe we're going to be recognizing 15 years of that. Um, here in a couple weeks at our Day of Remembrance. So those of you in town, I hope you can make it to Arlington for that um, as we think about the crews that came before us. And, and, you know, that's what we take seriously. We take our safety seriously. We take all the things we're trying to do from an agency perspective um, seriously. And it's a number one priority for all our missions, you know, whether we're going to the International Space Station like we are today or whether we're on our way to the moon or even in our science missions that don't necessarily have people involved um, in, this, in this capacity. And frankly, the resiliency and the the environment that we're in today, actually, you know, it, it's just another piece of that cog of the safety machine that we have to deal with. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And we're constantly looking at ways to improve those processes so that we can do this. And system protection, enterprise protection, as I call it now, is a critical piece of that for us. Um, when we think about all the systems that are flying in the environment that we're in, you know, we designed a lot of these systems long before we had some of the threats that we're dealing with now. And they're on orbit. And what do you do, right? That's the challenges we have, not just us, but a lot of our, our, a lot of our other government partners in this area. So when you think about the incredibly complex world we're living in, we've become very global, not only in communication, but in the systems that, that, we're, that we're building. You know, it's just, it's just complex and, and it gets more and more that way. We got critical missions that, that, that today, we have at least the opportunity to bake in some protections at the early stage of the game, right? That's usually the best time to do these things. Um, and, and we're working on that. But also, as I said, I've got missions that are on orbit that I've got to figure out how to bake something in after they've already been flying. Um, you know, and, and it's not just human missions. It's the science missions that we have today. Some of those are critical from a reputational perspective. Um, they're critical from a taxpayer investment perspective for what we're doing, not just the science, but we don't want anything to go wrong with those either. And don't forget aeronautics. Um, we have things flying in the atmosphere, and we're dealing with uh, the, the, traffic, the air traffic systems. We're helping FAA with that. I mean, all those are potential threats and vulnerabilities that we have to deal with from an agency perspective. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about the process that we go through and the challenges and, and, and mix that with kind of the challenges. I kind of put these in the category of environment that we're in. The first thing we have to do, and we do this annually, is we have to look at all our missions that we have, the ones that are flying and the ones that we're going to be flying, and determine what level are we going to do this. It's just a risk management process. We have a good framework in the agency where we assess the risk all the way from the technical risk to the financial risk to the schedule risk, just like everybody else does. But now we've added this other piece in here. What is our enterprise protection risk um, for, for each mission as we go forward? So, so we do that and we, and we, cause some of the things we're just gonna, you know, frankly, we're just gonna accept the risk. I mean, I got vehicles flying outside the solar system now. Uh, probably not gonna do a whole lot with that one uh, from that perspective, right? But I can still work on the, the stuff at the ground level that I can deal with. So those are the kind of things I have to think about. So, and then once we get that list, we, we actually start thinking about, okay, these now, I got the list, and these missions are in various stages of their life cycle. How do I assess what I can do and what's the right thing to do within the, frankly, the, the resources I have? Again, no, no different than any other technical discussion we have. The other thing that's fascinating about this particular, the, the risk that I think we're under that we're talking about here from a mission success resiliency standpoint is this risk is changing. You know, when I built the spacecraft that are flying, that tank needed to be good for 100 PSI. That 100 PSI didn't change uh, after I built the spacecraft. So today I can put a protection in place for what threat I know today, but that threat changes. And, and so I have to have a way to think about how I'm going to own, how do I on-ramp new protections? How do I build a system that's resilient to that? And so this is a case where, where that's different than our normal design standards. It's different than our normal mission assurance standards. And so we're working on ways to make sure we understand that. <clears throat> the other thing I've got is I've got a culture. I've got a culture of sharing. I've got a culture of openness. 1958 Space Act created us to be a civil agency to share everything. And now I'm telling my folks, maybe not so much, 
right? We got to be a little more careful with what we're doing and how we're doing that. And that's, that's a hard thing. And I've got a tremendous partnership with my international partners. I mean, they're, they're key to our success. And we've promoted that for years. Look at the International Space Station. Look at every science mission we fly. There is typically an international piece of that. And so we have to make sure we understand, we understand what we're doing from that perspective. I have an agency that's not full of folks that can really be educated on the threat environment that's out there. Not a lot of clearances, right? And so we have to have a, trusted, a set of trusted agents that allow us to go to these program managers who always assume that everything we bring forward is an unfunded mandate uh, that they have to deal with, right, when it comes to enterprise protection and resiliency. So those are kind of the environment that I'm in. Um, and, and, you know, I would say we have a pretty effective process that we have, but today we're stovepiped by the missions. The science guys might do it different than the, the, the human the human exploration guys different than the aeronautics guys and so for us at an agency level from an enterprise standpoint we have to we have to address that and think about that while there's, while i talk about those as risk and challenges they're also the reason that we're successful sometimes global interaction is great for us it's a great thing for us to do the proliferation of technology which he gets out there again a great thing that we can take advantage of but but where is just the accessibility to space i mean we're getting more and more access to space um, as time moves on you know, so there's, there's that other, kind of the other side of that same, that same coin as we go forward. So we've done some initiatives I thought I'd share with you guys to try to, to try to increase our resiliency. And based on everything I kind of shared with you there, a couple of years ago, we were, I was having several discussions with our team, and I would, you, you guys heard from Renee Wynn earlier. Um, this was before Renee was here, but, but I would have the CIO come tell me what they were doing, and then have the missions come tell me what they were doing, and the infrastructure guys would come tell me what they were doing. And you could tell they weren't talking. There was really no conversation across that. And so I, I decided it was time for us to kind of establish, establish what I called an enterprise protection program. Um, and so I, I assigned a principal advisor for enterprise protection, which doesn't make a really nice acronym. We were, we're learning. I should have done something different. Uh, the PAEP, not exciting. Um, and Ray Taylor reminds me of that all the time. But we was, Ray Taylor is doing that job for me now. Um, and, and his job, he reports directly to me as the associate administrator, my day job, not the acting administrator job. Um, and and his, his goal is to try to integrate all those functions that I talked about. It's really a cross, it's, it's a cross agency kind of activity. Very important because everything we do involves a lot of disciplines, right? They, there's all sorts of disciplines, there's expertise requirements. And each office does think about it just a little bit differently. And I need that, I need that a, a good, uh, that's good by the way, that I get the different approaches, but somebody's got to integrate all that so we can have solutions from an agency perspective. So Ray does that. It's one of the biggest jobs at NASA that nobody's ever heard of, right? Because he doesn't have, he, he, he's not attract, out there attracting a lot of attention. He's very much quietly behind the scenes trying to make sure that the folks that are doing the mission planning understand what's available to them, what can we do, or how can we help. And he has to do a lot of the bridge building from an influence perspective. Um, he's got a little, you know, he's got my backing, obviously, when he comes in, so that helps him a little bit, I think. It may hurt him sometimes. Uh, but there's multiple people involved in this from an agency standpoint. So, so we take the CIO. Obviously, you heard Renee. You heard what Renee's dealing with from that perspective. She's got the cyber protection. She's got the networks that go with us. The, our, our Office of Strategic Infrastructure. That's all our facilities, the ground systems. You can just imagine, you know, just, just pay attention to anything in the world where the Atlanta airport goes down and you can start seeing the kind of things that can affect you from an overall perspective and how we have to pay attention to that. You got, lo and behold, the missions. Right? They have their own opinion of what they want to do and how they're handling it. And so we have to bring them into the fold as well. Engineering, we want, we're trying to get engineering, um, or engineering is trying to come up with standards. How can we actually talk about standards? You know, we talk about 1.4 factors of safety on mechanical systems, 1.25 in certain areas. You know, we have those kind of standards you can write down. This is hard from a design perspective to write down an actual standard, especially when the, when the things change. And so we're working on that. How do we do that? And if nothing else, working with our our other government partners and, and, and industry is maybe what are some best practices that we can just share with mission designers so they can actually bring these to the table um, to, to be more successful. SNMA, SNMA has a mission assurance function for us. Uh, so safety mission assurance, by the way, I should say that. I quit, quit using my acronyms here. The Office of Safety Mission Assurance has the mission assurance function. And in this area, this is a much harder validation, right? Because you have to know what the threat space is. 
And then I have an Office of, of, facil of Physical Security, and they're my counterintelligence and threat assessment folks. They, they, they man, they're the ones that provide us that information and another source of knowledge. And then finally, I've got the Office of Interagency and International Relations. And what they do is they are my interface between us and the other government agencies we work with sometimes. So all those folks have to be brought together, and that's really what I'm trying to do with this enterprise protection activity. It's kind of integrate that, and, and hopefully at some point, after we've collaborated all that, I can now come back and say, okay, I have a, I have a single point that assesses and, and, and addresses vulnerabilities. I have a single point that can bring me back maybe some best practices or some design standards that we can inject into all our mission, pro, pro, uh, mission, mission profiles, but also into our ground systems, right? The infrastructure is just as vulnerable as the missions, right? There's really three, in my opinion, kind of three phases that we look at. We look at the, what I call the backbone or the networks and the common activities we all use. There's the ground systems that I use for my mission planning, and then there's the, I, I want to say on orbit, but also have air, aeronautics, activ, aeronautics uh, capabilities as well that I have to pay attention to. So to, to, to have a, a body that is comprised of all the folks you talked about today, you can review the, and, and do the mitigation assessments and dump it into our risk process, is actually, it actually fits pretty well for us, because our risk process, our normal risk process is, it is made to, to take this as a new risk, and you go in and we have a framework just like everybody else does, likelihood and consequence, right? And then whether you mitigate, watch, or accept, it's pretty simple. But you gotta have somebody tee that, tee that up for you so you can actually make that decision. And occasionally you gotta tell the mission guys, sorry, you're gonna have to do something about that, right? And that's how, we, that's how we're working on getting the, the resiliency into our system. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's critical for us to draw on the resources that we have available to us. And every one of those groups I talked about has different, different touch points outside of NASA so that we're not just doing this by ourselves. And I think that becomes pretty important. And with, with the broad portfolio that we've got between space, aeronautics, and science, and then even some of the technologies that, that we're developing, um, you know, we just, gotta, we just gotta be a little cautious about what we're doing and, have, and make sure we're not putting ourselves in a vulnerable situation um, that we can do. You know, we're, we're, we're big, we're spread over multiple locations. Um, we've got a great industry team that we communicate with occasionally, like all the time, uh, in terms of what they're doing um, from an overall perspective. And, and I think all the stuff we're doing to share that data is helping us, but we're all fighting the same kind of fight. Right? We're all fighting the same challenges with, with resiliency. And you can think about you know, you can, you can really take yourself down a bad consequences path pretty quickly. And by the way, it doesn't necessarily have to mean loss of crew, loss of mission. It can mean loss of reputation. You know, look at the data breaches that have occurred for people and, and things like that. So we have the same problem in our agency because of what we're trying to do. So they're complex missions, even the smallest ones, right? Um, so striking that balance between mission performance um, and mission protection is actually pretty complex too. I can't dump a lot of requirements on a CubeSat mission, right? I'm not gonna do that to them. Although, right, if they're coming through my ground systems that actually support other larger systems, guess what? And they're never happy about that. They always, they always, you know, not my problem. Well, it is really, it is your problem. And so that's a challenge for us. That's a cultural piece that we get to work with. It's also challenging because a lot of the things we wanna do are multi-year kind of investments. And honestly, at the one year, one year at a time budgeting process that we're having so much fun with, um, maybe it's not one year at a time, maybe it's three months at a time. Um, <laughs> that makes it really hard when you're trying to put the plans in places, in, in place that, that we want to do. But, but our teams are working through it. And you guys all know that. I mean, that's not anything that everybody in this, in this room doesn't deal with. But I just go back to balance. It's, a, it's, a, it's really important for us to strike that balance in a risk perspective of what do we really need to do and what, what can we get away with. Obviously our human missions are gonna be some of the most important we do. We do not wanna have an issue there and some of our big science missions um, as well. So it takes us a while to identify those and, and I think you know the, the key thing for us is, is to continue, have this continual um, following of the emerging threats. What are they? And then maybe have designed ourselves a way to give from a resiliency perspective to on-ramp changes to our systems to allow us to actually deal with those emerging threats. We got a lot of technologies we're looking at, everybody is, you know, different ways of comm, different ways of downlink, and that's just the stuff we're trying to do to protect our systems. But in an ever-changing environment, um, you know, we're, we're not naive about this, the dawning nature of these threats. 
Um, I think we're pretty confident we've taken some proactive steps, though, to actually pull this together. The, the, the Enterprise Protection Program was a big step. Um, in the agency, we have three technical authorities. We have a, really four. We have the risk taker, which is the crew, crew office. Um, we have the health and medical folks. We have engineering and SNMA. And we thought about making this a, another technical authority um, a, a, to have some, some, what we call some overall independent view of what we're doing. Right now, we're leaving it where it is. It may ultimately grow to that if we need it. If we start, if we get to that point, but that's kind of how we're looking at it. And I think just getting it established was a good, tangible step. Um, and, and you know, I started with this. We've always taken taken very seriously our protection and our safety of our missions and our crews. Uh, it's just it's just what we do. And this just becomes the next step for us in our normal process of, of doing risk assessment around what we have to do. The challenge here is we don't always understand. Um, the risk posture that we're in here, as well as we do sometimes on our others. So there's a lot of, you know, we, a lot of this adds, we all, have, we all have unknown unknowns, and a lot of this adds to our unknown unknowns um, as, as we move forward. And so we're always going to have those, whether it's related to resiliency and enterprise protection or whether it's related to, to anything else. So I, when you've when you got a whole entire globe engaged in what you're doing, um, whether they're actually really engaged or whether they're just the public that's amazed at the, 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 the successes some of our missions have done. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty wide open environment for us to make sure we're doing the right thing. And the folks that work this behind the scenes, people never see them, right? There's not going to be a ticker tape parade for my enterprise protection folks between down Pennsylvania Avenue, right? But a successful crew that comes back from Mars or the moon that gets that, gets that ride is going to be riding on the shoulders of the folks that are making sure they're protected as they fly just like our safety professionals, just like our engineering professionals. And that's something we're, we're paying attention to as we go forward. So a lot of great things ahead for us. I mean, we're getting ready to embark on a pretty strong lunar exploration program with, with an eye toward Mars at some point to make sure we're still doing that. Um, and we're going to have international partners coming with us. We're excited about that. We're excited about that opportunity. Um, but we're also walking into it, in my opinion, with our eyes wide open. Um, with the, with the risk posture that we've got around some of the threats to, and make sure we stay resilient. So I do think just like, our, just like all, the, all the other things we do to get, make sure our missions are successful, you know, that, that if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right, and we need to pay attention to that. Um, and I think enterprise protection for us and that resiliency it brings is going to be part of that. So thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to take some questions here with Sean as we go forward. Thank you. Well, Robert, you've generated uh, lots of conversation here among folks and lots of questions that have cropped up, so I'm going to try to cover uh, as much of that as your time is going to allow. I know you've got to head off here pretty shortly, uh, but I guess to, just to pull together a few of the, the questions that were asked and, and concentrated here in particular, National Space Council now, re reconstituted National Space Council, has just come out with uh, a very aggressive uh, policy proclamation, direction to go. The president signed an executive order. You've got lots of direction uh, and guidance, so to speak. And now the budget is about three or four weeks away from delivery. Can you give us a preview of coming attractions, how that's going to match? No, not really. <laughs> you should know that. No, I, I think. Um, no, for, yeah, you had to ask. I them, know, you know. I know. Shit. It's just like being on the hill. Uh, that, I do think the. Uh, um, We've been working on the plan. We've been working with, with the administration. And I think when the budget comes out, folks will see what we've been asked to go do and how we think we're going to go do it. So, um, you know, coming attractions. But uh, it'll be, it'll be, I think it's going to be an exciting opportunity for us. I'm pretty, pretty, the team's pretty excited about it. And I think it's going to, you know, when you think about what we're trying to do here, we've been talking about this for a long time, is, is utilize the International Space Station as best we can. While we've got it, it's a fantastic or orbiting laboratory for not only enabling the technologies that we need, but also knocking down some of the challenges we've got um, for, the, for the physical human presence in, on orbit. Um, we'll move out toward the moon and then hopefully just uh, always keep our eye on Mars so we can get there eventually. So I think you'll see something consistent with that as we go forward. So. Mm -hmm. Well, following on that and, and just thinking about your opening commentary of the nature of the international relationships with NASA, which is really extraordinary. I think that's one of the more uh, underreported or underappreciated aspects of what uh, NASA's engaged in is a wide range of international agreements and cooperation and partnering arrangements and so forth that are 
uh, in play. Do you see, one of the questions posed here was, do you see the, the International Space Station model as a, a potential uh, framework to go pursue for the broader guidance you've received in terms of the policy direction to back to the moon and on to any other destination as described? Yeah, I think, I think definitely that's going to be a, a kind of a benchmark or a best practice that we think we can pull on. But I think we have, one, we have another piece of that story as well. Um, the emergence of the, of, the, of the private companies here in the U.S., the American industry, really, really engaging in space uh, gives us another opportunity as well, right? I mean, we've got, if you look at the, the, what we've done with the public-private partnerships um, in the agency in really all of our, all of our mission areas, um, if you mix that with the engagement of our international partners who are, you know, I've had just great meetings with them this past year in terms of where we're going, um, I think that's what gives us the opportunity to make, talk about resilience, that gives us a much more resilient path as well. I've got mm -hmm. more players than, than we had probably when, if you go back to when we started Station, good grief, it was just us and the international partners. Now I've got industry in a totally different mode come into play and, and bringing those capabilities is going to actually help us get in, in a more integrated way, get a, get more mission done, I believe, for what mm -hmm. we're doing. So I'm excited about both the public-private partnership, but also bringing that station model um, to bring, and, to bring not only the countries we've been working with, but they're even more countries engaging at this point, right? How do you get them involved in that? There's a lot of emerging, com a, lo a lot of emerging space in other countries as well. That that uh, so there, it's it's really kind of a, I, you know, kind of that tipping point or that crossroads time where we got a good set of global capabilities that we can bring to bear. We just got to make sure we do it the right way. And that's going to be, I think, a smart challenge in integrating that. Well, it's, it, and, you, and you mentioned the, the broader expanse of the industry engagement now and the range of capacity that is uh, uh, now emerging as, as opportunities to, to really tap into. Um, but like the International Space Station, you've got a lot of international, global, industry players engaged in that too. Do you see this being of the same proportion and scope of that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's going to take all of us to do what we really want to do, which is push human presence further and further into space and hopefully at some point make that um, civilization level impact, mm -hmm. whatever that could be, finding life somewhere else, boots again on the moon, boots on Mars. Um, that's not going to, I think it, the way I look at it, and I heard it in the Space Council several times, these are my words, but it's, you know, American leadership doesn't mean America alone, mm -hmm. right? And I think we'll bring, we'll bring the rest of the world with us, but we're gonna, have, we're gonna lead. There you go. One probing question I think that was really quite um, uh, thought-provoking, I guess, that, that hopefully that it touches on many of the themes you addressed as well, is what is the balance between specific engineering risks and national strategic imperatives? Mm -hmm. At what point do you make that determination? And how do you put context to the difficulties of technical issues compared to that national public policy focus? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, been having several It was discussions. anonymous. Somebody yeah, ought to pull that up. That's a really good question. That I, one, you know? <laughs> I, we, we've been discussing this internally is, is we, when we, whenever we have a risk discussion, right, you can get so myopic on the actual topic that you're talking about that there's a greater risk, you know, and, it, and, I'll, and I'll be dramatic for effect, right? The, the least risky thing to do is not fly, mm -hmm. right? But that could also be the largest risk if you're not flying from a more strategic perspective. I mean, that's kind of a, that's kind of a, a real like, dramatic ends of that spectrum. But if you narrow down into the middle, there's those same kind of decisions, right? At some point, you, you got to say, look, we've done what we can do, and we're going to this eyes wide open. We, we, we may be accepting some risk, but you got to, for the bigger picture, um, you need to fly. And that's, that's that, we have that conversation, and we have a, frankly, we have a really good methodology to actually raise those up. Um, but you don't want to get into the point where you don't fly and you lose your leadership piece of that. But we try not. We we don't have many of those that bubble up like that. But but there will be some, I'm sure, over the next three or four years that we'll have to we'll have to manage that kind of a risk discussion. Mm -hmm. No question. And in, in furtherance of, of of that point, as well as your previous comments, uh, how do you regarding the international partners and international industry participation? Question then posed is how do you balance risks between 
all the partners involved. Yeah, I think uh, that's, it's, it's the best way that we've seen to do it, honestly, is just keep an open dialogue. The dialogue between us and our partners, what their objectives and goals are. <clears throat> you often, one thing I've learned this past year is, you know, the administrator always did most of the, most of the discussion with the heads of agencies and, you, you know, when you're, when you're now doing that job, it's kind of interesting, you get a different perspective. Um, it's a pain in the that, neck, isn't it? <laughs> no, I, I, I actually enjoy it. it only, oh, okay. I, I, I do. And I'll we'll, we'll be talking yeah, later here. <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you why. Because what it gives me is it gives me perspective on what's valuable to the different countries, right? And what's valuable to the United States may not be the same value that, say, Japan or, or Russia or somebody has mm -hmm. in, that, in that environment. Um, so they're investing as well. We're investing. Everybody's investing. And they all want to return on that investment. And what is that return can be different. And so... <laughs> For me, that's the risk discussion we have to have is, is I don't want to ever put my international partners in a spot where they don't want to come to the table with us because it's not getting the return on investment that they want. And I think that's understanding what's valuable to them is really important. Sometimes what's valuable to them is simply a crew, a crew, a crew member, yeah. right? We're going to invest this much money and we're going to have somebody on orbit for a period of time versus sometimes for us maybe it's, maybe, maybe I think, I would argue maybe sometimes we take that for granted in this country, right? We were more we worried about the technology and the, and the things we want to do, which are important. But having that crew, having that presence is very important. So, you know, if you think about today, you know, if any of you have kids that are going to graduate from high school this year, they will never have lived a day in their life without someone living in space, mm. right? That's a pretty phenomenal thing to think about. And, and not the same person, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> um, but... But that's kind of interesting, and you don't want to lose that, but that has taken a lot, that, that takes a lot. As you said, the agreements that allow all that to happen are complex. Um, they took years to get in place. Um, I tell you, somebody was talking to me about STEM, and I said, yeah, you need lawyers too, trust me, because there's, there's a whole lot of agreements like that that go through that process. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. And it's a, it, it, you, your powerful point on that, I think, is it, as hard as it is to bring together those, that consensus and those agreements, and understanding where every partner is coming from and so forth. Once you've reached it, it's solid. Mm -hmm. It's something that really does provide a sustaining element to this resiliency feature that is the topic of discussion today as well. This question, just to digress a little bit, but very much within your wheelhouse coming out of Marshall, as you have uh, from your prior uh, experiences, one question posed here is, how much do you see NASA relying on commercial heavy lift systems to augment and support the NASA, the moon and Mars and beyond objectives versus, or maybe in concert with, one modifier I put to it, reliance on SLS? How do you see that balance being, being achieved? Yeah, I mean, I've been, I'm probably on record as much as anybody as saying it's an and, it's not an or. Um, there's plenty to do, um, and I believe just like today, where we were able to turn over cargo and now crew supply to the International Space Station and not have a government system, um, if something comes along that allows us to do that, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the road, we'll, we'll continue to look at that. I mean, these become capabilities that we, that we have. I, I, I use with our team, we use a, a, the phrase um, lead, collaborate, and leverage. There's places where we think we need to lead. Right, as an agency. And we're going to own those as we develop technologies, as we get those systems in place that we think need a government role. Um, you will see that, and, and this has happened multiple times throughout the agency's life, you then begin to collaborate mm. more with, with industry, right? And once you collaborate, before you know it, they take it. And now you leverage it, right? And so mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at, you can look at several examples of that. And that allows us actually to let go of some things and move on to the things as the agency should be doing. So that, and you just continue to repeat that cycle. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I mean, if you think about, just think about how many things in our industry today are commodities that government probably did all the work for so many times, right? I mean, we'd never build a chip these days, but yet we did a lot of that, right? And so, so how, do you, how do you move things from NASA, develop, lead, to a commodity over its life cycle. Now in space, what I'm learning is that takes a little bit longer than probably we had hoped. Mm -hmm. um, but you can even go back to the aeronautics, early days of aeronautics, same kind of model played. And, you know, yeah. 
nibble around the edges, but that's really what happens. And so I think that's the role for us. And I think um, as long as we have that capability until something comes along to replace it, we need it. If something comes along to replace it, we've got to look at that. Mm -hmm. But I also think there's plenty to do in all the arenas that we're talking about. No doubt about that at all. Well, you're, you're, you're parallel to the, the civil aviation uh, market space, in which we see the ubiquitous capacity now to fly to just about anywhere, uh, all emerge through exactly that same pattern that's you right. defined. And it happened at a slower rate than what we're seeing today. But that's a function of, I think, the Moore's law and the capacity of technology to, to constantly uh, find new opportunities for insertion that leverages all that. Uh, but it, along the way, is, it, it, what it, is there a criteria in your mind and that NASA employs over well, how do you differentiate, for example, between what really will be focused on and requiring of an SLS capacity versus the range of other choices that could be made based on payloads, et cetera, et cetera. What's the, what's the pedestrian <laughs> definition of what that criteria would be? I think, I mean, I think we deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis, honestly, right now. And I think the challenge is, if you think, and I'll use station for an example, um, you know, what, with, with the way we look forward, right, we, we say, okay, in five years, where are we going to be? And in five years, um, are we going to be ready to, to, to move that onto something else, move that to somebody else? And if so, what does that mean? What, you, know, the, you, you almost have to unwind what you've done. And the way, and looking five years ahead is difficult. I mean, if you, if you I mean, I think uh, sometimes it's difficult in uh, a positive way, in that people came along faster than we expected. And sometimes it's difficult in a, negative way that, wow, Let's we're see. not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> and making that prediction, you can only do the best you can. And right now, I think that's what we're trying to do. I mean, Bill Gerstemeyer, I think, does a fantastic job balancing that, that conundrum that you talk about. Um, but I think what you do is you take the capabilities you got, you assign your work to those capabilities, and you just always have to be open for things on ramping to allow you to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the way we do it on a, on a pretty yearly basis with the, the process we're in. That's great. Well, you, sp you spoke at the, at the earlier part of your com a formal commentary that uh, one of the great elements baked into the 1958 Space Act is the capacity to exchange, make available on a very wide public basis uh, the intellectual property that's essentially that's developed by uh, NASA over the course of all of the research activities that go into this. Uh, yet at the same time, we're seeing an emerging variation of this, and you alluded to this, finding yourself in the awkward position of trying to now frame exactly what is going to be releasable. Uh, one of the questions posed was, it appears likely that China will emerge as one of the most important uh, spacefaring nations uh, sometime over the very course of the, of the near future. Can you describe the future of our cooperation with them, particularly in science and exploration, as it pertains to that exchange of information? What, yeah, what strictures do you think are going to be involved there? Yeah, I think what we do is we continue to monitor what they're doing. Um, we have multi, multi uh, lateral control or multilateral meetings with the, in the, and we're allowed to have, have the Chinese in there and they share with us. We share with them what we're doing, and this is all all the nations that are involved. I think. You know, to me, they're, they're, they, as they emerge, they're, they're nearly, from, a, from our thinking and our process standpoint, they're no different than any other country. We want to know what their capabilities are. We want to know what they can bring to bear. And then the policy question is kind of outside of our control. We just share that with, in my opinion, the administration and Congress. Hey, here's some capability. We, again, we can leverage <laughs> or we can ignore whatever, whatever, you know, that's kind of your options. Um, or we can collaborate. And so I think to us, um, We'll just pay attention to what they're doing. That's really what we can do. And, and, and I think this is an opportunity, frankly, for the Space Council as well to weigh in um, mm -hmm. at, a, at a very large level from a policy perspective. Um, and, and the Hill has thoughts on this as well. So I think that's just something we're paying attention to um, in, in every one of the multilateral control boards we have because they're there with us having those conversations. So. That's excellent. No, that's, and that, that is one of the great values that the Space Council will bring to this is to mm -hmm. join I think so. Questions like this that may otherwise not have been 
properly treated within those venues. So that's a, that is an up, a, a plus on, on that as well. It, th this is a derivative off that same set of questions, but it's one that does speak to the same vulnerability question. Um, if, if you had to try to guesstimate what portion of the the, uh, uh, the space related kind of, of, of budget NASA works with related to software activities and how much might this change in the future to increase resilience or not and agility in the face, face of those natural and intentional threats. Same kind of derivative question. I, I would I don't have any idea, right? That would be pure <laughs> speculation. All I know is... Yes, that, yeah. Right. I mean, what, what I would say, Sean, is that um, just like everybody else, we've become much more much more dependent on software and, yeah. and, and the kind of things that the Internet of Things that are out there. I remember, I, remember I saw, but I also know from a NASA perspective, because we have like a ridiculous backlog of maintenance and repair, we got a lot of old stuff, right? And for one, I, I remember when the big power thing happened at Atlanta Airport, one of the guys at Northern Georgia said, that's not a problem for me, I still have oil field breakers. Nobody can hack an oil field breaker. Um, <laughs> NASA's got a lot of that kind of infrastructure still too, so it's good to, good to procrastinate sometimes um, where people can't get into that. But, but I do think part of it is as we become more dependent on that, we just have to recognize that's a risk, right? It's also, again, it's taking advantage of that technology because that technology allows us to do some incredible things. I mean, you look at what we're doing with software, everybody's doing with software, frankly. I mean, it just, there, there are things we used to do that had required hardware, and now I can just do a code. I mean, it's unbelievable. However, again, there's that, that potential risk, and I think that's the balance we're trying to strike and make sure we're doing the right things with the best practice. And there's a whole lot of people, a lot of people in this room that, that help us with that, to understand where those, where those things are. I mean, you know, I mean we, got, we got engineers that do what they do, and they always create back doors and things like that for themselves. And, if they do that, they do that for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. from that standpoint. So we just got to be careful and understand what that what risks we're taking when we do that. So because it does change that posture changes. Well, it, in the previous panel uh, before your arrival, Renee, when your your CIO, uh, at least uh, I think lightheartedly uh, offered the view that uh, legacy systems aren't all bad because everybody else has transitioned away from them except NASA. Yeah. So you know, it's one way to, to steal yourself to it, but she, uh, I think, recognizes yeah. that there are limitations in where that modernization is going to go as well as being mindful of, of that that she expounded on as well. So that's a very uh, consistent point. This is a, a provocative question for both of us. I'm not you know, reticent to bring it up at all. Uh, what do you see as the, as the challenges that have changed for the NASA administrator when compared to earlier times? And they, the reference point is the 80s and 90s. I don't only guessed on that, I, that not me. But <laughs> you know, what's your view of how you've seen those challenges change, just from what you know of the history of the role as well as the responsibilities involved and watching you know, as far back as the beginnings of the agency itself? Well, why don't you answer that first? You, you would know. I'm going to let you off light right, because I'm not. Uh, gonna, I'm going to give you a straight I, one. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, th I don't know if the I don't know if the role has changed that much. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, to me, the NASA administrator's job is to run the agency at the direction of the of the administration. Now that direction may change, and, and there may be things we do differently. Um, but I'm not there really. I'm I'm there to inform policy, and and help educate what I think the, the implications of policy are. But after that, my job is execution, mm -hmm. right? My job is to go do what I've been asked to go do by the administration and Congress when they, when they finally appropriate the money to us. So um, I don't think that's a lot different. I think that the major difference will be um, how much you can educate folks going forward about maybe in the risk regime. And I'm talking about risk at a to more strategic risk level than maybe the down and in technical risk that we talk about on a daily basis and mm -hmm. that's where I've seen um, the willingness to for us to engage in those kind of conversations I think is probably the one thing that, that I've seen this past year that we've done probably more than we have in a while but I'm also the acting guy so it's been easy to do that <laughs> uh, you know, what are they going to do mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so but we have engaged pretty 
pretty, pretty directly in that with the administration. And, they, and by the way, they've been very receptive. That's been one of the advantages to that. So that's my, I, I just think from day one, it's been execute what you've been asked to go do. Right. Well, it's, I, I guess, you know, reflecting on the history of this really storied agency, um, over all this time, it, it came about over its nearly now 60 years, uh, it came around as a consequence of really a, a, a consensus view of why you needed an agency with this particular capability consolidated for all these kind of focused efforts. And part of that was uh, around the uh, exploration and discovery and scientific pursuit and technology enhancement, everything else that we've embraced and come to realize is one of the great attributes of NASA. But it was also around national policy. It was a demonstration of resolve on the part of the nation to say, if we can do this, imagine what else were possible for us to achieve. And that came about, I think, as a, a, a collaborative uh, kind of view that had no partisan limitations to it whatsoever. What I see today is starkly contrary to that. It's one where there's two different definitions and never shall the twain meet. And this is one that, I don't blame you for going down this road, it would be imprudent for you to do so. So I'm, I'm impressed. But liberated from this capacity, and now let's say whatever I want, uh, <laughs> this really is one of the more difficult problems that I see. And it's just this dysfunctional consequence of how the administration and the Congress, and this is not a, a new thing, but it's certainly being accented today, right now, to the point where agencies and departments uh, are thinking in terms of week to week, you know, budgetary consequence of this. What do you do in the, this is flat irresponsible. There is no other way to describe that. And that's a, an abrogation of the public responsibility that, that the administration and the Congress has to accept. Uh, that is now taken for granted. This was something that was viewed as just a, a you know, a proposition that would only come around, around as a result of that very rare condition of incapacity to reach consensus on national policy. Today it's a daily, minutely event. And that, that is really just a dysfunctional situation. And trying to manage in that, I admire you. I could not do this. There is just no way that would be feasible to accomplish. And that's not to say this was a, you know, an, an easy path that was pursued over the prior decades by any means, during my time or anybody before me or thereafter. It was more a consequence, I think, of just the, the capacity to not be able to follow any kind of you know, process and procedure to reach resolution, and that is you know, a testimonial, I think, not only to your, uh, your capacity, I think, to really kind of work through those vagaries, but also to see it through. And for that, I think all of us owe you a debt of gratitude for keeping a great agency uh, still operating function and fo focusing on the objectives, notwithstanding all this backdrop. Please join me in thanking Robert Lightfoot for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And my important task is to remind you that lunch is now served. <laughs> so.